Okay, welcome. My name is Ramon de Javier. I am uh, not a master of calligraphy, but I'm interested enough at it. And we're going to learn some simple calligraphy and talk about different styles and things like that. The goal of this is to um, give you an opportunity to practice. So if you have a pen or a pencil or something like that, um, this will be a good way for you to practice some of the shapes that we're going to do. I actually have a second. Um, I have a second screen which I'm spotlighting right now, and so that's where I'll do my work. And we're going to do a little bit of practice to try and make different letters that way. Um, I can see the chat, so if you've got questions, you can ask there, and I'll try to answer those as well. And we're going to actually start out though by um, going over four different calligraphy hands. So I'm gonna share my screen with you here. And um, we're gonna look at the different hands and kind of talk about when they came from there as well. Okay. So the first hand that we're looking at is called unctual. Unctual is some of the earliest uh, hands that we have in, um, that we find in writings and things like that. You'll see this up through the fifth century and a little bit beyond. Um, this is closely related to what the Book of Kells was written in. This is a lot of your early manuscripts and it's kind of a transition out of Rome. It's a very curly and wide style. Um, it's very, it's very nice if you have a Celtic persona or you're looking for something that maybe is in a uh, early, um, just after the fall of Rome, is found throughout those different areas. It's the style that I'm the most familiar with and I kind of like it. I think it looks a little like Elven that Tolkien uses or that's used in all the different movies. So I like writing in it a lot. Over time, unctual changes and becomes a different form there. And that becomes Carolingian. And I'll share this later when I post things, but Carolingian is like unctual, but it's a little more together. You can see it's a little less wide and it's named Carolingian because it's named after Charlemagne and kind of his era. And this is about the seventh century this is what you'd start to see books written in like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or some of the early history books as well. And it's a good mid-period um, style. It's nice. Um, if you're going for the high Middle Ages, however, that's where you're going to want to look at what's called Black Letter or the Gothic script. And you can see that this is much more angular. It's much more up and down um, there. It, it's what we traditionally will sometimes call the Old English if you're using it as a font um, there. And it's a good example. All of these pages are just examples of how to shape and make your letters. And so as we go along and do those, we'll see a little more of that. And then finally, at the end of period, we get what's called chancery or sometimes called italic. And this becomes a really common script that you see throughout the documents that exist. It's relatively easy to write. If you practice it and try it out, it feels a lot like cursive. And there's several ways that it can be connected together uh, that makes it uh, very easy to flow. And it looks pretty if you write it. And if you're making something for a light, late period persona, uh, this is a good option. I'm gonna go back to the top really quick and just talk about something I'm noticing in the forms. In a lot of these forms, unlike uh, uh, cursive or something today, there's a lot of move, set, move, set, and different things in that way. And as we start to kind of practice and try that, I think you'll notice that there's kind of moves and pushes that are very different. The other things that you'll see is that some letters are very wide and very long. Some letter letters are very close together. All of those are different um, things to be aware of. And as you're designing a scroll or you're writing a letter, be, be cognizant of that. Another thing that's also something to be aware of is a lot of these have recommended pen heights. And so that's when you look at your pen, see how tall it is and 
This is a suggested height for the letter. You can experiment any way you want with that and produce different heights based on the width of the pen. And going through that, you'll be able to do a lot of different things. So those are, that's a quick introduction. I thought that was going to take longer. I talked awfully fast on that, but let's get to uh, looking at my attempts at some forms and talk about some of the things I was doing. And then we might even have you whip out your own pens and try along. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. We're going to look over here at the highlights. <clears throat> so typically, you would use a, you might want to use a, a calligraphy pen or even a fountain pen for making your scrolls. In this case, I picked myself up um, some calligraphy markers just so that we have a consistent flow. You wouldn't really want to make your scrolls out of this because they'll fade over time. They're not acid um, fast and they also have a very clear when you overlap with markers. But this is a really good way to practice. And for some reason at the Joann's here, they lock them all up. So they're obviously a hot commodity. People are just dying to get a hold of these, I guess. Um, so I'll show you the tip on them. See if we can get that there. They have a very flat tip and it's kind of blurry, but that gives you that same thing that you'd get from a quill or that you would get from if you were using a um, if you were using a uh, stylus uh, or a later period pen. And that's important for the practice, but you could use a chisel tip, uh, chisel tip uh, marker or just practice the forms using some of the other pieces there. Other things that you'll probably want is you'll probably want a ruler at some point when you're going through different things and a pencil to mark out and to do the shape. Um, we even still see lines of marking on scrolls traditionally and traditionally the few scrolls that I've done, I have marked out and left the uh, pen lines in there, but you can go back with an art gum eraser and take care of that as well. For practice, I've also found that you can get some nice sheets of kind of a grid paper. You might want a graph paper, but you can also go online and you can print off sheets kind of like this one. So this was my practice from earlier today. And what's nice about this is it kind of reminds you to have a pen angle um, and then it kind of shows you an area, area to do that. And when you're practicing your calligraphy, having those same sheets just like you may have had in grade school. Admittedly, some of you today probably didn't have sheets like this in grade school that you wrote. You did everything on the computer. But back in the day when we did handwriting and calligraphy, uh, we would have lots of these sheets to fill out. And it gives you an opportunity to look and practice your shapes. And before you even start a scroll, um, you really should get that layout and all these things figured. Sometimes if you have a really fine vellum or paper, you can take one of these and you can place it behind the paper. I don't know if we'll be able to see that. No, you can't really see it and it doesn't come through, but you can sometimes place it behind and use that as a tracing guide as well for that. Um, this practice paper that I've got here is just kind of mixed paper for ink and things like that. While you could do scrolls on that, I would re recommend something more along the lines of a really fine watercolor paper because that takes the illumination well. Or um, there's a lot of papers that are called vellum. They're not real vellum. They're just vellum styled um, that can do it well. If you can get real vellum, I would practice for like 10 years before I wrote on the real vellum. Um, not really, but it's rare and it's a hard thing to handle there. So are there any questions about the different hands or the fonts that I went over? There are other fonts that are out there that are more specific. Um, I have another book I'll just show you really quick. Hey, Javier. Um, yes. Um, 
that first font you showed us, that was the earliest font used time-wise? Well, there are earlier fonts. Um, you can see some Roman fonts that are a lot um, uh, very similar to that, but within the kind of writing on parchment font here, that, that first font was the farthest back in time. You'll see that from the about 200 through 500 uh, common era. Thank you. Sometimes it's called the Irish font. So I have this great book and it might not show up good because it's got a lot of there, but Learning Calligraphy. This is a book of lettering and design. And in this, it goes through a lot of the ideas of how to hold your pen, how to go through and form some of the letters and create some of the lines and those different things. And it has all different names for the ones that I introduced. So it calls unctual Irish. Um, and that's partially because we find a lot of the unctual in the Book of Kells. Um, it also calls uh, chancery italic. Um, it introduces a Roman hand as well. Let's see if I can show you the Roman hand that they're showing. And that's the Roman hand that they're showing. And I really think that's more based on carving of letters than actual written documents, but you may find that occasionally there. What's nice about it also is it gives you some pen angles to put your pen at and suggestions for each of those as well. And you'll find each of those there as, as well. Calligraphy is very popular, so there's a lot of good books on it that are out there. Um, some of the stuff in here is quite pretty. Shows you some of the crazy italic capitals and things like that. So those are all kind of a part of what we see there. And probably many of you are much more experienced in me than this, but I am glad you are here to share and talk about those different things. So we're gonna start with unctual because it's the furthest back and it's the one I like and I think I'm good with it. Of course, you think you're good at something and then you won't be able to uh, really do an example. And just like, um, just like you might be doing a uh, embroidery sampler, um, these sheets, type of sheets can be good samplers for you to think about and learn what you're doing. So I'm gonna put my uh, guide down below and I'll put my little design up above and we're gonna to try to make some happy letters there. So I like to use a wide pen for unctual. I feel it looks really good, but that's a personal choice. In this one, we're just using the guide ahead of time. So let's start with an A. And uh, the reason I'm starting with an A is I am terrible at A's. It seems like I am cursed with the value, with uh, vowels. You'll see when we get to E as well. So I've got three lines set up here and you could make a mark of three lines as well or just use some lined paper. I'm gonna angle the tip of my pen to the side, try to get that 20 degrees that it's mark, it's showing down here below, 20 degrees there. See if I can get my hand around. This is a fun thing, watch Javier try to manipulate things. I have a very interesting rig that I've sent up to try to write on, so it's creating some interesting challenges. Okay, so I'm gonna start over here and my hand is right in the way. So we're gonna to try to learn how to write without our hands in the way. So I'm laying the pen down. I'm going to come up to the side, come down and make the, the back of the A there. I'm about halfway here come up around. Now that one ended up a little sloppy. I might want to try it smoother. Of course, I'm not going to do this on a scroll, but I'll come smooth down and around to get that A. So if you want to try that A, you've got an up, down, and around to try that. You can go a little different. You can be a little more loopy. 
And as you go around, you'll see changes. And what you want to do is build consistency with that. Now, if you look, those A's are a lot more out than mine. So I'm going to try for one of those A's too. So that one I got more out, but I had a bigger belly on it. See, I'm very not consistent here. That's why it takes more practice. But there I'm starting to get what I'm wanting in my design. And as you go, you can kind of specialize and change your different thing there as well. Okay, now in this one, you'll notice the B is a capital. And you could choose to continue to do the capitals. Because this is inheriting that Roman style, they don't so much have the concept of uppercase and lowercase in a lot of the Roman things. And so we'll see over time there's an adaptation. So we're going to try this B right there. It's showing me that it's coming down here and we're picking it up. We're going to push one to come over and push one to come over again. And once again, this is short. We're only using two of the letters. You'll see longer ones in the other one there. So we're going to go down. And then we're going to pick up, come over, pick up, come over again. And that's a B that could kind of be anywhere. But as you can see, I'm better at my consonants than I am at my vowels there, because I got that B right away. So I'm not going to do a billion Bs. But let's go to the C, because the C, in, it creates a very interesting thing here. The C, the first loop of the C is not the top. When you draw a C today, if I draw a C normally, it's all one piece. But this is a two-piece maneuver. And you have to judge your maneuver appropriately that you're going far enough over to be under that second part of the C. If I don't go far enough over, I create this C that looks like it's going to tumble over itself. So if I go, for example, here and make my C and do that, and then I come over here, the C is really top-heavy. So I want to look at trying to start that line over for the C almost in the middle of where I'm choosing, coming over and then making sure to go way over here and then come way over and around. You want those really full round letters. That's what you're going to see as an example for the unctual is these very full flowing round letters, almost like uh, Elvin's script. So if you look up, um, so I'm geeking out here. But if you look up like the, the doors to Moria that the elves made, and they've got that really cool looping elven script, I think this looks a lot like it there. The next one here, there's two versions of the D. And your choice here is going to be based on what you want your script to look like. If you're OK with something that's very formal and up and down, the straight up and down is really good. But if you're going once again for that smooth flowing script, you may want this secondary D. Once again, I'm going to skip a little bit here, but we're going to go over to start that, coming around and down, and then up. And then this one goes up above, so we're going to come up above, hit the other side there, and make that D. I'm very happy with that, with that D. And uh, I will not write a thousand more Ds because I got that one right. I don't want to show you more that how terrible I get as I go along, right? Let's look at some other letters that might prove interesting. The M right here. Now, these are, of course, suggestions. You could make an M that looks a lot like this N. But I like this M because it, it's got the same loops. It's got that come over, come down come down, and then this font has the little line across it like that. Gives you an interesting thing there. You can see your J's are coming down below the line. Unctual doesn't have a lot that goes above the line, but this K does here. The L also seems to be a little raised. Now, down here, though, we've got some letters. And in this, it has a little note. It says the J, the V, and the W have been created as these forms were not used in this alphabet yet. And so our J there has been created, and we should all know that from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, when Indiana Jones jumps on the J and falls through, and then his father says, but the Latin Jehovah spelled with an I. 
So J is something that if you're doing a really period spelling, you may not want to use the J. You may want to use the I or come down here and use a Y for that. You'll often find a Yehova or a Jesus or a, a different thing there. In Spanish, the Y is called the Greek I. And so that gives you a little thing there as well. If you want to be a little more period with your spellings. The other things that we have here is the W's. These have also been created. This one is a delightful upside down M. The other W's are right there. And the V's have also been created there as well. And that's very interesting because it kind of shows you that in the Latin at the time, these sounds were being made differently and so they weren't appearing in the writing. Although supposedly, I've been told that in, in appropriate Roman Latin, it is not vidi vidi vici, it should be weedy weedy weechi. And so I often wonder why the W wasn't used or why the V was a W, but say la V, I guess, there. Is there any letter you'd like me to demonstrate on this? Any questions about the unctual? Anyone that you'd like to try? The W. The W? Okay. We'll see if I can get a W here. So, we'll bring that up a little closer so you can get a better view of the W. It has a starting over to the side there with that tail coming down and then going up, picking our pen up, going down again, and then doing the third coming down and then crossing the center. So we'll choose a place to do our W. Let's not waste paper, we'll do it over here. And usually you don't have to hike up on the pen that much, I'm just trying to make it so you can see. So we're gonna come over and come down. There's one, come down with two, come around with the third, and then if you want to, you can put your little symbol in the middle there. That's optional because it's usually useful if you're writing a lot of these together, especially if you're writing words that have a lot of U's or O's by the W. So we're gonna try again, come over, down, come down, and come around there. And if I were to write another letter, so let's say I do a U right by it, it gets a little confusing. So that extra little tick right there helps you to have an idea of what you're looking for. And that's a lot of times where you can do reader things. I mean, if we get fancy, we could be like, oh look, we'll put little dots on the top. I have not seen this in any manuscripts except in Lord of the Rings. But instantly now it looks like Lord of the Rings writing. Okay. Some of the fun ones too, I like the Q's in here. I'll do a Q real quick. Oh, and the O. Let's go to the O first. The O is like the C and causes me a lot of consternation because it's so large. But if we're coming with that O, we're coming wide over, and we're gonna come wide over there. And we want to kind of create that shape. And you can see my U is terrible and my W is jumped all up, but my, my O is very lovely. And then we can change our O's quite easily by just going with a tail. And then we have a Q. We can try again. Let's make another O. And then we'll do this other elaborate tail here by continuing on and going under. And there's some places where you can kind of experiment and add those flourishes, but you always want to make some room. This is nice because it has the room between it to make those flourishes as well. Okay, any questions on the unctual? Anything else you want to try or want me to try and demonstrate for you? This goes really nice if you're going to add, if you have someone who's doing not work or those very elaborate um, kind of Book of Kells style lettering that you have there as well. Okay, well, we're gonna move on to the Carolingian. So this is, a, this is gonna be progress of me getting worse at writing because I do not have as much practice 
with our Carolingian style here. But that's okay. It's always good to practice. So some of the differences that you can see is the Carolingian starts to become a lot less round and we have the concepts of lowercase letters here. So there was the unctual and you see kind of the Carolingian kind of going more upright and getting taller. So this would be one that you use a three on as well. Okay, we'll start with A once again. We'll be all really good at writing A's if you're writing along with us. And there are some people on here who I know are a lot better at me. A shout out to Lady Naname who is watching. She is amazing at scrolls. Okay, let's try I that. Term, but thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna do that A, come over, come down, come up, come around like that. I'm pretty happy with that A. It's not quite the same angle. Come over, come down, come around, go up. And if I put that little tail on there, I can go into the next letter and almost create a cursive if you're wanting that kind of look. We can stick that B really close there. And once again, you're showing that angle this one's once again that 20, almost 30 degree angle. Coming down, oh, I angled it too far, coming around there. Oh, but see, I missed right there. Let's try that one once more. Coming down and over, coming up and over like that. And you'll see that between my two styles, I'm gonna start to look very similar partially because I do so much of this. So this is something where you have to practice out. You have to practice that straight. And in this paper, I've got those angles. So it's not as helpful, but I can use the lines to build. Coming over like that. And I can always go back over with my marker. With your pen, you might get too much ink on that as well. I'm not happy with the B, so I'm gonna keep doing the B. That's nah, better. Let's go on to the C. Once again, I find these letters, the C's and these shapes sometimes are very difficult um, for me just because the roundness and, and also we do it differently because when I do once again a C in English or an E, not English, in modern writing, I start and do the whole thing and separating it out makes it difficult. This C that's right here it has a very flat edge. So that means I can actually start up above and come down and around and up for that. So if I start up above, I'm actually gonna start at the middle of where I'm doing the letter, come down, come around like that. Then I'm gonna come over the top like that and leave the little dip. And there I've got that C. The E here, I like that E, it's very different. And you'll notice it's like one step away from a et. So let's do that E real quick and then I'll talk about the et. And if we, so we have the E and if we just go like this with the little T, we've got an et and we can use it as an and symbol and we can save ourselves two letters. See, try to wake myself up there. There we go. If you look at the writing styles, there's a lot that they try to use um, a, uh, they try to use a, uh, oh, they're trying to be frugal with their use of letters. So if they can use something that's an abbreviation, they'll use that abbreviation as well in those different places. And that makes reading the documents real difficult. Um, as part of my professional stuff, I often do a lot of uh, handwriting, reading, and things like that. And if they use the abbreviations, you may have no concept of those. So it's really important to look and figure those things out. But you as a, um, 
as a uh, scribe today could use abbreviations as well uh, in that because it was a perfectly period practice also. Let's try that E one more time. I'll choke back on the thing here and see what we can do. So my rig for shooting this is actually made out of a upside down ankle loom with my telephone on top of it, providing us with the images that you're seeing now. So that's some SCAA do-it-yourself creativity for you. I was going to ask you what you were using. That's, that's pretty tricky. I like it. So even, there we go. I'm much happier with that one. Here we have these really tall Fs. And I've been told some people do not like the Fs. Um, any of these long letters. <laughs> so we're going to give ourselves some space to look at that. We're going to take up as high as we can go. We'll come over and down. Come down and we're going to go below the line there. Oh, I drew on my other paper. You could pretend I was so much better, but I drew on my writing paper. We'll go back in there and finish a tail. Then our second move is to come up and across. And our third move is to come back and do that. And that feels like a big sloppy letter. I want to do something a little tighter, so we're gonna try it again. Uh, I didn't get it that time either. I can see why you dislike the letters. Anonymous F disliker. Okay, let me try one more time. <laughs> the hard thing with the F is that it also, you just want to make it big and you need lots of, you need to squeeze things in there. And sometimes if you don't plan out your space, you suddenly find yourself writing all these things and you're like, oh, I want to, I, I'm going to put a dash and we'll go to the next line. And while you can find examples of that in historical sources, when we're giving this as a gift and we're using kind of modern sensibilities, having an apostrophe, or not an apostrophe, having a dash, having something connecting that together, it feels like you as the artist may have laid it out wrong. That being said, forgive yourself and use it occasionally if something goes terribly wrong. I mean, if your Fs are totally messed up, that could be that. Our G here also gets very interesting. So we're gonna go down a line to use some space for that G. So the G starts out with that O shape. So we're gonna go around to form the O. It then has a little over there, then we're going to move the paper down, and we're going to give it a tail. And I often might go back and do a tail slightly differently. Come in with a different direction and do the tail. You get it that way, but your Carolingian, some of those are difficult. We'll go into that H next. Trying the H, choking back on the pen. And you can see in these, like, these printed off versions, they have these very lovely wide exaggerations and things like that. And that is a lot of manipulating and learning your pen technique, allowing the ink to come down more, almost like a Japanese calligraphy. And so that's something you can practice with time. Often, if you're, if you're knocking out scrolls quickly, you might not have time for that. But if you've got a good amount of time, it's nice to take that after, extra time to practice your letters. This H looks like it's actually starting up a little bit. So it's coming up, going over, and going down. Then coming out with that real narrow line coming along that way as well. The other thing we can do is we can switch to a more narrow marker. 
and try some of these shapes as well. We're going down just a millimeter. We'll see what effect that has. And we can even go down whole sizes that way. So this one is a millimeter smaller. The camera does not want to focus on it very well. And this will give a much thinner stroke. We can put the strokes comparatively just a little bit there. We'll try that H with a thinner stroke. And sometimes what you'll see is that a certain font will look much better with a different pen width. And that's all up to personal preference. The monks who were doing these fonts they were going to have to cut their own, um, cut their own quills and have their own choices. I was listening to a very interesting talk about the preferred feathers for doing different things. I'm very happy with that H there, and how if you were the king, you would have things written in eagle feathers, and if you were the um, a duke, you might have things done in goose feathers, and that all of the feathers that they used were entirely from the left wing so that the feather curved right for people who are right-handed. And that was a very interesting thought on making quills. And writing with a quill, it's not Harry Potter. It's not scribble, scribble, scribble. It, it's definitely that type of very consistent working that way. And just a comment on Harry Potter, they would have adapted to other pens instead of trying to do that. And there's no way that a young Harry Potter having been grown up in the primary school system of Britain would have been able to write with a quill right away, first day in Snape's class. Sorry, geek coming out there. I love all the geek cross-referencing you're doing, Javier. <laughs> Me too. I really like the K here from the, from the uh, Carolingian. I, I like that look. I'm going to try and get one of those. So let's rise it up and try to do the K as well. So nice tall, start up high, come down, pulling it down, stopping, coming over, swinging around swinging down and coming up. And I put it really narrow in that space. And often I like that narrow look too that you can get where they're close together. Sometimes I have a problem I've been told with gifts that I've given that I've written my letters so closely together they're illegible. And unfortunately that is something you should practice not doing because you want people to read the scrolls. I know that very typically scrolls are red with the writing on the behind, but there is occasional that that falls off and it can be very difficult. That should actually go, no. I'm not happy with that K. Coming down, no, 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 no. Yeah. Down, over, coming around, stepping up, coming down with the K. Is there a specific letter anyone would like to see or try out there? We actually have a different letter here. Does anybody recognize this? F. That is a different one of the letters. It also would make a similar S sound as well, but it would be a softer S. And you'll find that our modern alphabet is very much influenced by the alphabet of actually Germany um, at the time that the Gutenberg Bible was printed because the typesets that they produced, it was easier to just use those. And so a lot of times this larger, softer S um, was either turned directly into this S or became an F. And you can all probably think of the other letter that we also show up here, which is the Y, which ends up replacing the th sound the thorn there and that then we get yield tavern instead of the old tavern um, because that y change and then we also have the other thorn that disappears i'll try and write those other letters real quick um, do, do you recall when the 
the ash letter was, I guess, abandoned maybe? That is, you have, I think it came around the same time of um, the kind of printing revolution. Um, so it was but, much later then. Yeah. I just, for whatever re reason, remember that letter. I am just checking real quick. I have a little history book here that I'm looking at really quickly. The, the, the letters that we've lost from English are the F, which, okay, here we go. We're gonna write an F. F is a fun one. We get it from the uh, Scandinavian. So F comes down, around, around like this, and across there. And that's what gets replaced as the Y. They use that as the Y. And so that's the the V in the old. That's the Y that we have there. So that's the one that disappeared there. We also have the thorn, which was a harder TH sound. And so our thorn would come down like this, and then it had a nice little thing right in the middle there. And that was often mistaken for a P. And so eventually it just got replaced with a TH. They didn't put the other Y in there as well. Of course, standardization in spelling doesn't happen until the 1800s. Before our W, oh, and that helps me answer that question. Where was our W? Well, we had a letter called the win in Germanic. And the Germanic win looked like an N coming down and then came over and touched right over there. Some of you probably have seen those letters, but it's an N that's touching itself there. Um, it's grabbing its toes. And then we had the yog, which the yog is a, uh, the same sound you make in loch, like our neighbors to the north, loch salon, that's a yog. I probably said loch salon wrong and lady, or her excellency Kazmira will uh, uh, tell me I have said it wrong but it essentially was a backwards three. I've gotten way off topic. This is where, not intended where I was going to go, but I'm going in that way. It's, it's quite interesting. And then we have our ash and our ash was really just quite literally just mash your A and E together. But we can take those letters and pull them together for your ash. And then the also forgotten ethyl um, takes our fun O shape and sticks an E on the back of it there as well. So those are the, the missing letters in the English alphabet. So you've got your um, now I can't remember them, but the sound, another th sound. Here we've got your w sound. Here we've got your h sound or your loch. There, loch lomond. You've got your a here as an ethel read the unready, and here you've got your oe sound. And these are very similar to those kind of umlaut sounds that you have from German. And of course, in German, they would have made these sounds with little dots and things like that. But as the printers got over. They just didn't put those in there and it was kind of an optional thing. So that's where a lot of these disappeared because they were specialty letters that were different from the standard Roman letters, different from what was being used in Germany. And so they vanish out of our letters there. Okay, well, as you saw, my Carolingian was not up to snuff. I would not be a good servant in Carolin or in uh, Charles uh, 
Charlemagne's court. Oh, he's got so many names. Everybody wants to be named Charlemagne. So let's move on to our black letter there. And I'm going to use the smallest of my little pens, the one that says it's a one millimeter for that. Was there any other questions about Carolingian or the random missing letters? If not, we can move on. No, here's my G. Wait, there it is. I'm proud of my G. Is it oh, backwards? Oh, it's a very nice G. That looks I am going to share your G with everybody. Just a second. Oh, okay. Hold up your G. Do, do, do. Actually, it looks the right way on there to me. Does anyone else have some letters they want to share? Very nice, Aaron. Okay. Well, you can always share them afterwards, share them on the Facebook post or whatnot. Oh, here we've got some more. Ah, oh, these are very nice. And you're using a real pen there too. Really nice. Okay, so the black letter, which is also called the Gothic, which is what they like to call everything in, um, is what they want, like to call everything that happened in the middle of the Middle Ages or everything that happened in the 13th or 14th century um, is a very vertical style. Um, it's very up and down, it's very close together, and it has a very extreme angle. They want you to put your pen at that um, 45 degree angle for sure. So we can see some of the examples of that. This one's nice because it shows it with some of the big letters there. And this one also gave us some capitals to go along with as well. And I was having a very hard time with this. Show you my practice sheet from before. Um, really, when I came over to the middle ones here, I started to getting better. Um, I don't know what I was writing right there, but probably I should take a lot more practice on these letters. I was trying up here to do it again, and you can see that I was trying to really go into my Carolingian and my other style there. Okay, I lied, I'm gonna to go to my second level pen because my smallest pen was too small. So this would be a good one for vertical lines, but the lines we have are not so vertical, but I'm gonna draw really tight. So instead of trying to fit it across the two there, I'm gonna try and fit it across a single one. And I find that that gets me the results I want better. So the A starts far over here coming across, right? And then it wants to pull down and down and a little bit up. And then pulling over, down and up. I like this A here, but it's a little bit confusing. So I might not use that unless I was doing a little stylized scroll, but I'm gonna try that A again pull up to the middle, pull over to the side, pull down there, pull down at 45, pull up, pull up. And you can kind of see it's a very angular process that you're going through. This is why I have not joined the 14th or 13th century mafia. I don't want to have to write like this. And while I do like the uh, leggings and the chosses and the braids and stuff, it's very fun. I just don't think I quite have the body for the Cote Hardies. There's my fashion advice for you. Are there really mafia players? Oh, I... I had some good friends in the Outlands who called themselves the 13th century mafia. Oh. <laughs> they were just convincing everybody that, oh, you know, you don't want to do late period and you don't want to do Viking. 
you want to do that that good area right there in the high middle ages. And that stuff is great and fitted cotardies are awesome. And there's a lot of great pageantry and that is great for a lot of different people. But- Okay, I see. <laughs> but not for me. <laughs> okay, we got some A's there. I'm happy with the A's. Got some screaming, ah, going on. We're gonna go do a B. Now this one, these are very decorative. There's lots of extra little bits to them. And I guess you could come back in and do that. I'm not sure how you would do that shape in a single stroke, but I'll try. Well, maybe. The B here is only a little bit higher than the line. It's not all the way up. You can make these really tall and thin if you want, but these are doing real squat little ones. Coming up, going down and over, pulling up from the middle, going down and over. And I guess you could come in, see that they're breaking the rule though. If you, if you have that little tail coming out like that, you're having to turn your thing around. And that, you don't wanna to have to turn your thing around if you're writing an entire Bible by hand. So just keep that nice down, over, up, over down, over, up, oh, nope, I forgot a part there. Okay, down, over, up, over. Just some happy little bees. Everybody needs some happy little bees. Here's your Bob Ross reference for you. The C, moving on to the C there. The C once again, Always we're starting on that back side, the closest to the, to the left, to the sinister side, coming down, over, and then coming up, over. A C like that, my C looks like an R. You can try it again, coming down, and then it shows doing an up like that. I like that better and then coming down like that. Try it a little larger, we're gonna go down, up and over. And you can do them large and spindly or short and thick. Those are kind of choices to make in your designs for that. We've got a very nice X right in there. That's a fun one. Their Y is fun. There, the Z. I'm not sure what letter they're showing us there, but there's another fun letter. Once again, there's our nice long S showing up there. Here's our R. I have no idea what this letter is. There's just extra letters on here. Any guess? Upside down R. I'm gonna call that a meh. Sometimes they like to use R's, different variations of R's. Or sometimes they like to make extra flurs with R's. Sometimes they like to uh, just make shortened versions. If you go along, you're scribbling fast. That's their version of, oh, got it's put true. on the top. Oh, well, don't care. If, if we draw that one real quick, I just realized here's the outer bump of your R. There's the little tail of your R. So they just left out the rest of the R there. Got it figured out. It just took a few people. Let's try some of the capitals in here. Are there any other letters that people would like to try? Let's do the O actually, over here at the O. We could try it with a big fat marker or I'll try it with a big fat one. So the O, this one starts up and comes down and comes down and then you pull over there and then you're pulling toward yourself and down and then you're connecting right there your o is very box shape there i almost think it looks a lot like a french hood if you're more late period it's got that peak going on to it you can also start it over further come down and over and then start closer into it and kind of make it an offside shape there as well that N also looks a little fun. Let's 
try an M. Oh boy. Let's try not that M. Let's try again. So we're doing that straight down, then we're coming up, pulling down, up, pulling down, kind of there. That is not nearly as pretty as that other M. Their M is a little wider than mine. We'll make a wider M. Pull up, down, up, down, up, down. But the Gothic is very vertical. It's very narrow. It's supposed to be neat. This is one you'll take a lot of practice on. This would be great though for, you know, a very traditional looking Book of Hours style scroll. Once again, right there from the middle of the 13 and 14, 1500s. Kind of, well, not quite the 1500s. The, you're talking about the 12 through the 1400s is when this would kind of fall into that category as well. Okay, let's go try a capital letter. Is there a capital letter anyone would like us to pick? Try this S. I'll try that S. Let's see what we've got. This doesn't give me any instructions for how to do that S. So I'm just gonna have to guess by looking. And that's a lot of, if you're going back to real documents, you're just gonna have to guess. Now, S is always special because you start with the middle of the S. So we'll do one middle of the S, two middles of the S there. Then we'll get the top of the S there. And then it shows a line coming down from that top of the S to the bottom. But I suspect down, like this and over like that. I like that S, that turned out okay. Yeah, it's great. But sometimes you'll just have to guess on those different things. Let me see if I can find the capitals better in the Gothic script as well. Jump into my other book here real quick. Thank you for your patience. The Gothic script also, people really like Gothic for making things look um, really religious, I guess you could say. No, it doesn't actually, my book talks about Gothic capitals. but it is not giving me shapes for Gothic capitals. It's just telling me how I could do them wrong. So on here, you can see they very much want you to line it up within these lines so that your Gothic capital is not significantly larger than your lowercase there. And of course that will be a principle that you'll want to choose. A lot of times if we do a capital letter, we want to do it a lot larger. And it just looks more uniform if you use it in there. Of course, as you're writing things, you know, you'll use the capital letters for someone's name, but it's also okay to do lowercase letters for people's names as well. There's another one of those nice fun S's. Actually, I haven't done a lot of S's, so let's go and just talk about the S real quick. So we did that big S. Let me do a unctual S for you. We'll jump back and then we'll try and do a lowercase S in here as well. So once again, that unctual S, you want to get those curves. We'll go a little further over. It's going to start over here, go over there, and then you pick up the rest of the letter there. So you're, you're pulling that center and then building onto that center with the last pieces. And then the S that we're shown here in the Gothic, or in the black letter, as it's calling it. Once again, we're gonna build the center of the S first. And then we're gonna go on and attach 
those other pieces. And of course, if you get a really tiny little pen and do that, it's too small, no one can judge your calligraphy and they'll all say it's amazing because the king is holding it up in the distance. And the only person that will ever know is the person who you got your scroll with. Of course, you should give them the best scroll that they deserve. Let's try for a little tiny S. Oh my, that's the most lovely S. <laughs> little tiny, so far away. <laughs> that, that's the problem. Like, I love when scrolls are held up in court. Um, but if there's a lot of gold leaf on a scroll, I see shiny gold leaf and I don't get to see the art. And I don't know if we, it, I guess if I were king, I would have like a mandatory, okay, everyone in their scrolls stand to the left-hand side here. And after court, everybody go by and say, ooh, ah, that's so beautiful. I do really appreciate when the artists post their scrolls on um, online forums afterwards, because it's amazing to see the talented work. Those scrolls make everything happen. They make everything feel special. That's our job as the scribes. Okay, the final form I'm going to give you here, because somehow I have managed to fill this time, is the chancery script. Are there any questions about the Gothic? Silence. I sent you a oh. message. Do you want to read it? Oh, there we go. Um, I have a couple of shots of medieval calligraphy by Mark Drogan with capitals. Let's let's see them. Would you like to share those with us? Sure. Do I need to share my, scare my screen with you or you have them to hold up? I have, I just have screenshots on my phone. So if you want me to share on there. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, we've so. given the power that multiple people can share simultaneously. See if you can do that. Okay, just sec. If not, you can say, um, you can say not. Uh, we have Vigdis asking, are the, are the letters in Gothic always so close? And, uh, oh, there's a, there's a great shot of some of those. Those are real pretty capitals. Let's see. Let me find another. Answer the questions. You're spacing on the Gothic. You can open them up and space them um, in various ways. In fact, I'm gonna show you another one here in a second. Okay. Let me do another real quick. That's a good one too, I think. Oh, I like that one. And see, that, that yeah. has some nice openings to it. Although some of those T's look a little bit, they look a little bit like they're escaping from uh, unctual, but that's totally okay. It's kind of transitional in some ways, which I don't mind. Okay. So I wanted to show some spacing on the Gothic here. And I love this rounded Gothic where it's being written in the round. And you can see that the spaces are nice and open and easier to read. And then it has those really fun flourishes on the top too. And I think it says these sheep shearing came and the hay season and then the harvest of the small corn. Don't know what that's about, but it looks really pretty. A gothic font there. And then someone also went down and made some roots too. Okay. But that's also the fun thing. Like we can be very artistic with our scrolls. We can do things that other people didn't do as we're doing those different things as well, and we can be creative. Um, I think the biggest rule is to make something memorable that people want to hang on their walls and uh, that people want to talk about, not just that they got an award, but they were also, um, they got your artwork. 
So here is chancery script, sometimes called the italic hand. And look, it's dated right there, 1400s to 1650. goes right there to post period. This is what the clerks were trained in writing, uh, especially in the English courts. Um, this was so that they could keep records and you can go back and you can pick out these records and you can look at them and you can see their hands and you can read all the great funny laws and the different things that way. And it's very close to a modern thing. What you'll see is they're trying to do most of these in a single step. In fact, the A, if I can get the A over there, they got a single going on there for the A. I'm gonna put a new piece of paper out for me. Oh, that's a used one also. And I printed these off at printablepaper.net if you need to get that for practicing. You can also lay it yourself, lay yourself out a paper as well. Okay, there's a new blank piece of paper. I like this in a, in a thin one, so we'll try the thin one there. Okay. I'm gonna go for an A. Now this one is saying, it recommends kind of a, a very high angle for that or to have a high angle for there. But once again, we're holding our pens once in that area of the 30 to 40 degrees. We can do an A, a single up, and a down. Oh, that one's a little too big. Maybe we'll do a nice small one coming down, a small one coming down. Now the fun part though, is when you get to things like our Bs, our Bs could be super tall. There's a fun little thing coming down there. Our C's, I like these C's, they're all one piece. One piece C's are nice. See that B again. I really like that big, big exciting flourish there on the top. Our D starts out just like a little A, little A, but then it has a big flourish on the top and a tail. I, I enjoy writing in this style um, because of kind of that big wide flourish look, but you got to plan out very careful or you run out of room very quickly. Once again, these can be spaced together or as far apart as you like. I'm not happy with that H. I'm not happy with that start of an H. Sad thing though is that pen is very permanent. So when you put it to when you put it down, you should practice and be happy with the style that you want. So I'd say before you do your scroll, you know, practice writing it out again and again and again. It doesn't have to be on your nice paper. Use some of these markers to practice that feel and then practice it with your ink. Make sure that you're happy the way the ink is flowing and then go to your final for that as well. Take time, make it nice as well. Coming down to this line, I'm going to do a K. The K is real fun. Pull over, down there, pull a nice little bubble, pull down and up. See, I am much better at chancery script. My L needs a little more of a flip there. And this is great for late period personas. If someone's playing someone who is from the 1500s, who is in Tudor England or in um, Ferdinand and Isabella, Spain, or is in a court of the Medici, And it's nice and legible and easy to read. That O didn't turn out the way I wanted it. We want to know like that. 
You know, exactly. Travis, I think this was when I was at school, I think this is what we learned was this. You know, one. this was probably very close and it probably feels pretty comfortable. And in the book here that I've got, which I, I may copy these pages and add them to the thing there. Um, they type, talk about joining those letters together as well. And that starts to make things look very um, together. It is interesting though, it says, it, it's trying to tell not to do the informal joints, but to do the formal joints there as well. And so there you can put your, you can put your different work together and use your old um, calligraphy from school, your things there from back in the day. And these get used very nicely. Here's some examples of those. Um, and they're just a very common, easy style to use. Hey, so I was very happy with those. I'm like, oh, these are turning out really great. And those are great for late period scrolls as well. Of course, adding the flourishes is always the part that makes it the best and that kind of changes it, but not everybody had time to write all of those. This one has some capitals in here as well. Okay, well, it's been a good run on this. Is there any questions about the chancery style, the italic hand? Once again, it's always called italic because they claim it came from the Italians. Um, it was always fashionable to say it was an Italian hand or something like that. This was also a time though that printing was on the rise and, lit and uh, literacy was on the rise as well. So there was a great effort to attempt to make this more consistent in its style and more uniform in that as well. An interesting thing about literacy, you're just gonna get an aside here. Um, one of the causes of literacy was the cheapness of paper that showed up in the Renaissance. The ability to make paper cheaply um, was something that you start to see in the 1300s and the 1400s. And partially that was because of the plagues that kept going through. People were dying, they were selling off their clothes, but when it came to the linen underclothes, they didn't know what to do with them. They, nobody would rebuy the old underwear or the shifts or things. And so they sold them to rag merchants who started boiling them, adding them to paper pulp and making very high quality, well, not high quality, but very inexpensive linen paper. And suddenly there was a whole lot of paper available. And well, you've got a whole lot of paper. It's really cheap. What should you put on it? Let's put everything on it. Let's talk about how much we dislike the queen. Let's talk about how much we think this type of uh, magic spell or ointment is really useful. Uh, let's talk about everything in daily life. And people would just read anything because literacy became popular. Uh, paper became the memes and tweets of their day and all sorts of things would come out on that and everybody who was anybody pretty much could read um, if they were in the cities. Maybe the countryside not so much but it was very popular to be literate and to be able to pick things out and you know that was the beginning of the modern era. Unfortunately it was paved with a lot of death but it's important to look at times like this where things are not so great and say, you know what, there are positive things that can come out of it. One of the things that's been super positive that's come out of this uh, COVID-19 virus is the rise of classes like this, being able to teach online and get people to watch. Usually I wouldn't be able to teach this class um, to a group like this. This would be really hard to teach in person because I wouldn't be able to write and practice. But okay, I'll get off of my soapbox there. Any questions? Oh, were slates or wax tablets not used? Yes, slates and wax tablets were very common. And that's what you would take your quick notes on. So if you were in the university and you were listening to a professor and you were like, oh, that's, that's something I need to memorize, you would be writing on a wax tablet or a slate. 
Uh, wax tablets probably more um, just because the slates were uh, a little more expensive to get and the chalk was a little more uncommon in some areas. But that wax tablet, that was real easy to reuse, to heat up again. You could take your notes and then you could take that home and put them in place, things like that. So wax tablets were great things um, that people used and also to practice with as well. So thank you, uh, No No, for that question. That's a great gift too, like if you have wood to put together or you're doing something, make someone a little wax tablet, you know, take and melt some beeswax or some candle wax into it. It can be a really fun thing to give someone um, for a very personalized piece of largesse or a gift as well. They're not very hard to make. Okay. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Other comments, questions, complaints, good gossip? We are recording it, so it can't be that good. No gossip here. Thanks, Travis, or uh, Javier. Yes, well, thank you very much for participating. I do have some handouts. I'll link those. Um, it, it's a, it's a examples of all these writing here, and then I'll keep adding and building those, but I'll link that uh, in the Facebook group. And then when I put this up on the uh, Kingdom of Artemisia website, we'll get that information there as well. If you are in Artemisia, please self-report onto the University um, of Artemisia form there and get your credit for doing that. We want people to be participating and telling us how much these arts and science things are happening. So thank you once again. You're welcome to stay in chat for a little bit, but I'm gonna stop recording now. <laughs>